Today we're dealing with Chapter 6, Occupations as Microclasses. David Gruski and Kim Whedon's reconfiguration of class analysis. I'm so yeah. fucking ready for Kim Weed and Wayne Gretzky <laughs> talking about microclasses. <laughs> fucking go! What's that guy who did, like, Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Uh, Joss Whedon. Yeah, Joss Whedon. Right. Is there somebody in my mind, like, when you see Dave Gruski, like, I'm thinking, like, is there some famous buddy? I, I'm sure that there is. There's somebody called Slutsky. Can we call him, like, is there is there, is there there a famous person called Slutsky? I don't know why I'm saying uh, this, but I mean, there is, maybe? isn't there? Let me Who see. Who Slutsky? Yeah, Eugene Slutsky was a Russian I, and Soviet mathematician. How about that? All right, yeah. Slutsky, yeah. A, yeah. a storied name. Wait, Slutsky? Slutsky, man. Slutsky, what a great name. It's I would like Eastern that. Eastern European. Who, uh, that's my name. First, uh, like, overall impressions of the chapter. I kind of like the game metaphor the best in this chapter. I'm a gamer. When you combine two things that I really like, games and communism, you got your games and my communism, my communism and your games two great tastes that go together. I just love it. I, I mean, in all seriousness, I do. I really love the, enjoy the, the metaphor and how thinking of, of these different kinds of analysis at different levels, big class is focusing on like what game you play. Yeah. I, I like that. I like the game metaphor too. And I also really like that, you know, I've only been, I was only like last, like a few weeks ago for the the chapter on Michael Mann, and it was it was kept at such a high level of abstraction. And and whereas this, I I, I really enjoyed the little section at the end. Well, I guess we'll get a chance mm. to talk about where Wright is sort of able to be like, okay, like here how here's how these sort of things would apply over these different kind of eras of capitalism or shifts in capitalism we've seen over the last several decades. Which and and that's why it makes a certain amount of sense that the analysis of of Grusky and Whedon would would kind of become more seem more plausible. And that made it feel like nice and grounded, which I liked. Um, whereas yeah. I felt with the man thing, it felt like like it wasn't like a straw man position, but the position was a little bit out there. And so it was very easy to dissemble without actually like explaining what would be the benefit of this in a particular context. Whereas I felt like he kind of got that here, which was which was interesting. I think it's solid stuff, you know? I really like the metaphor as well. I, I'm going to completely concur with Sophie. I think it's an excellent way to think about things. It's extremely clarifying for people who are only kind of getting into like politics or Marx or radical politics to get it explained in, in such a simple way. Very revealing. There's like, how do I put this? The game metaphor and the kind of three-tiered class analysis that's presented here is in some way, I think, maybe even better than the one that's sort of built up over some of the various chapters because of the nature, because of the predictive nature of microclasses for explaining a bunch of stuff that Marxists have always wanted to explain by using some form of class position, uh, which is, you know, being determines consciousness. How people's life reflects how they think, right? And so... If, if you can weave in a research program that is, you know, a little bit successful at that with the broader, like, Marxist framework, that sounds powerful. That sounds like a powerful step towards something that Marxists have been trying to do for a long time. And, and then the game metaphor knits it together rather elegantly. And it is my go-to metaphor for trying to explain different types of maneuverings. And the last section of this giving the sort of intellectual history as Bob was pointing to about why this, in a way, why this like sort of mirrors the shrinking horizons of our time, but also how that zeroing in is, it could be a good thing when woven into a bigger framework. So yeah, this is one of my favorite chapters in the book. When, when you say it could be a good thing, what do you mean? If you cleave off this, you know, microclass analysis and actually dispense with all the macro classes and refuse to look at those. It behaves in an ideological way to sort of annihilate the big classes from your outlook and annihilate the essential critiques of property relations and capitalism. You know what I mean? And so there's an ideological function that Wright is aware of that he points to as being, you know, something that is potentially negative about the framework, but Wright has this virtue centric approach who, or he's not trying to be like, ah, you piss ant, look at this, look at this, you piece of shit. 
He's trying to see how maybe you can abstract that part that is useful, this microclass part, weave it into a greater framework so that you don't lose sight of, you know, the big classes. Like, if anything, microclass would be an excellent foundation from which to scale upwards to think about class consciousness in a more granular way. Yeah, there's this interesting connection here. I mean, we'll have a chance to just because like as I was reading it, what I kept kind of thinking of, and, and you know, he meant uh, he mentions Bourdieu in the analysis and mentions, I think, kind of implies maybe if, if it was that 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 um, Whedon and Grusky are are kind of influenced by it. But it reminds me a lot, like the micro class analysis reminds me a lot of like a Bourdieuian like field theory, right? Like field like where. Theory. Yeah, like people always are interested in Bourdieu with like the cultural capital thing, but like obviously one of the most mm-hmm. interesting things he has is like like lesser known is like field theory where he kind of posits like uh like the distinction of like different kind of like professional fields as like the basis that having like different rules of the game, different forms of cultural capital, different forms of accreditation and then actually like really do powerfully determine the way actors within and between those fields act, right? So like, like the journalism field is different than the academic field, is different than the field of, uh, you know, let's say academic e- economics, right? Or, or even to the extent to which, you know, like academic economics is different than academic sociology or something like that. And, and, that there, and there's a lot of struggles within fields to like set the agenda of the fields and who has power and so on, right? Like, and they involve very specialized forms of, consciousness and accreditation and cultural capital and so on, right? Like, like how you rise in journalism might not be how you rise in mm. academia, for instance, right? And what, what makes you powerful within that field. And so like, there's something about what Grutsky and Whedon are doing in the way that Wright describes them that reminds me a little of that. And I've always found th- field theory kind of interesting. And so at, at least at a particular kind of level of abstraction or level of analysis or something. So, so I found that very, I found that very interesting like the way it's it's being described in this chapter. Like Ezra, getting to what you said there about using the understanding of micro classes for a kind of radical proposition, you know, political strategy or whatever. It, it seems like, I don't know, for me, I kind of feel like that outside of, you know, history turning and material conditions ripening, we're unlikely to see, even if you had good strategies or of, of micro strategies, say communist micro strategies that were targeted at different micro niches of society. I, I don't see much hope for that outside of large scale, you know, material conditions changing such that, that the rules of the game, say, become up for grabs. What are you trying to get at with the, with the micro classes there? Well, there's a number of things. There's one that's just analytical understanding the formation of class consciousness as a real process instead of how some, you know, German Russian guys imagined it a hundred years ago and turned out to be wrong. Then there's the, what uh, Arnold from fight like an animal calls the, the differentiated appeal, something that advertisers are good at and leftists are famously not. And a lot of political actors are, are not terribly good at the differentiated appeal. A lot of Marxist theory is sort of written for sociologists more or less, or certain types of academics And a lot of the stuff that we find convincing kind of flows from who we are. If you were, let's say, trying to build a mass revolutionary movement or something, you cannot rely on people that have the dispositions of sociology professors to be your sole guide um, (laughs) in building like like a sort of coalition or, or whatever. So I don't know. I guess there's a couple approaches from which I find this interesting. It's not that I think that you well. Clearly, the march of history is between sociologists and plumbers. Um, and, you know, we need to you know, put in all of our, our resources into attracting plumbers or doubling down on sociologists or whatever. Like, the, the march of history is between Gretzky and Slutsky. Yeah. Slutsky and Sluts. I, I, Gretzky, Gretzky and Sluts probably do have something, something uh, a bone to pick. But, you know, that's for another. We've slandered. Oh. We've slandered did you, did you say bone? Did you say bone? No, no, no. Every, oh, everyone is crazy. I never said a word. Never said anything. <laughs> Tom, you've been talking this whole time. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's just like, yeah, just like what we, for, for me, I, like, I, I kind of feel like outside of large scale material conditions changing, that these 
strategies that we or new ideas that we can get out from understanding this mm. stuff i still wouldn't give them much hope that's the way i, I approach it that it, oh like, yeah sure but like but mark marxists are kind of useless for the most part so you know if we could be if there's like a little bit of utility that'd be cool instead yeah. of just people getting their own, you know what i'm saying like like we're trying to like well what's interesting to me is that it, it feels like you know thinking of like Joe Plummer, not the actual guy, Joe Plummer, Jesus, but your average, like, working class schmo in America, or anywhere, really, like, the thing that they're going to, like, really identify with is their occupation more than their big class. But what's interesting is that according to Whedon and Gretzky's own empirical research, micro classes are more predictive on in almost every single way, except... Mm -hmm and life outcomes. And in that case, big classes are much more predictive. Mm -hmm. Or as predictive. And so, or at least as predictive, right. I think they stated that the big classes were more predictive with life outcomes and... Did they? Uh, okay, um, yeah, let me just the check out here. Let, let me, Actually, let we'll me get just, to it. Yeah, we'll get it. We'll get to it. But, the, but, you know, just as a matter of general but discussion. The point is, like, it. you know, it's interesting how without being you know, inundated with Marxist theory, this is some, the average worker is just going to, like, be identifying with their occupation. But then the thing that matters most to pe most people, I would say, you know, bread, food, where's my next meal coming from? How's my life doing? Where is my income? Their big class, the thing that they don't really think about mm -hmm. consciously is actually much more predictive. I do also think it might, like, when was this, when was this book written again? 20, about 2010, I think. 2010. Okay, that's interesting. Because, like, it, like I think... 15. 2015, sorry. Oh, really? Okay, so later than I thought. All right, this is... Because one thing about Gretzky and we... Like, like this micro-class framework, I, I all, there is an aspect of it where I wonder if it's, like, it's a very kind of... The way the way that, that Wright frames it is, like, it's a very kind of end-of-history type of analysis. Right. Mm -hmm. Like it's an analysis that's born out of a period of time in which uh, both alternatives to like global neoliberal capitalism seem to be like more or less non-existent and in which the political horizons of people are, are oriented are at best around moderate reform and often like not even that. Right. And I do wonder to the extent to which these same types of arguments make as much sense in a period of, I guess, like what Gramsci would have called like an organic crisis, right? Like a, like a crisis in which like people are no longer convinced that they're going to be able to reproduce themselves and the, and, and the well-being of their family and, and so on. In which case I feel like they're, that, that some kind of big class might in the end up being a little more predictive like i think you'd sort of see that with the rise of various forms of like right populism and so on where like people really start re-aggregating around even even though micro class positions tend to like make a pretty big impact like whether or not you're like a member of like the petit bourgeois like small property you know small business owner it seems to make a have a big impact on whether or not you like go trump versus being like a petit bourgeois like educated professional to, who ends up going kind of centrist dem or something in the states, but there is a certain amount of I think of reaggregation that happens when things are kind of in in, in a state of of sort of crisis and people don't, can't take the reproduction of this of the system they live under and their own life chances for granted. So I don't know. I think that's something worth worth considering, like whether or not that is still like whether or not that that there is still some predictive worth in thinking of. Thinking of like maybe think of the relationships between micro classes and so called big classes, right? Yeah. I, I, I think I, I think this kind of like relates to what he gets at towards the end of the chapter, where yeah. you know he's kind of refuting a line of argument from before, like if something isn't active in the world, why should a sociologist care about it? And so you can say that you know this argument was made er earlier in the book about class is only real in so far as there's economic organizations that represent it. And in this case, you know, it's sort of taken to its logical extreme. Class is only real to the extent that, you know, people think in terms of it and it affects how they, you know, that it operates in this specific way. And Eric Olin Wright consistently makes the argument that, no, even if this, even if these kind of bigger class 
things aren't the subject of what people are thinking about all the time. It, you know, it's not like it sort of seems like it was in, in the old days, of, you know, workers movements and stuff where even if those, I don't know, in our collective memory, we think of those as much more universal kind of humanist things than they really were, which is, a, it was a little more profession oriented, a little more in, industry oriented around logistics. There are these moments of upheaval that Wright points to. And, you know, he's pointing to the response to Scott Walker's uh, anti-union activity and uh, Governor Scott Walker's uh, anti-union activity in Wisconsin in 2011 and the victory of Syriza in Greece. And, you know, whatever we right. think of his examples, the point is, is that, as you're saying, Bob, these, there are these moments of reaggregation where the big classes matter again. And it, it almost seems like it comes from out of nowhere sometimes. But if you're a good sociologist, yeah. of course it doesn't come from nowhere. Yeah, that's right. And, and, right. and you know, what we might think of as big classes might shift as capitalism shifts, right? Like, I mean, there's, there's some been arguments made by, you know, areas of kind of like in the intellectual traditions of things like autonomous Marxism, like people like Lazzarato or so on, that, for instance, like your relationship to financial speculation and real estate can play a pretty significant impact on, you know, like, which is certainly at this point, how it relates to your position within regimes and relations of production, right? Like, like in Canada right now, for instance, the political divide between homeowners and renters is massive mm -hmm. because of like 30 years of like using loose monetary policy or what people like Nick Srinicek call like, uh, you know, right, like fiscal Keynesianism, right? Uh, or mon sorry, monetary Keynesianism or asset-based Keynesianism right? Where it's like, yeah, all of a sudden there's this like real division. Like there's tons of people who are moving, to, who are young people who like people think of as like woke or whatever, who are, who seem to be moving to a far right candidate based on that person's promise to like, you know, uh, not keep just pumping f cheap money into the economy um, in order to keep real estate uh, uh, prices spiraling out of control, right? Because all of a sudden yeah. people who have very different occupations find their life chances extremely connected to each other based on how they relate to finance capital and how they, and, and as, as, as part of that, how they re relate to uh, real estate, right? In a, in, a, in a capitalist economy, Canada, in which real estate is a massive, ludicrously massive chunk of, of uh, the economy um, and also of people's assets. So it's like, that, that's not an agglomeration that would make any sense when things are going okay for everybody, <laughs> where like the system seems to be running fairly well. Like even if running fairly well means like brutally exploiting a, a you know a large part of your work, work working base. But now all of a sudden it be it's become a really huge predictor. It seems to be becoming a very big predictor of where you're going to land politically. Like we see the same process in Ireland with Sinn Fein doing well because of housing policy. Like we see that you know we say that it's financialization, but but really it's in the relations of production that have led to financialization. So somebody might have that direct link, but it's really because of the relations of production that have shifted away and we've got a different kind of a, a, an economic model that's kind of evolved in the West. But yeah, like it's not even clear to me like how you can do research on which predicts more, say, micro classes or say large classes, because it seems to me that the, the that, that it's very, very time dependent, that these aren't static relations like you can see that the predictive quality of, say, the large classes are obviously different in different times. And I would say if that is true, we would have to say it's probably very true that the micro classes also have different effects at different times. So like our, our, our one, one of our kind of things to do is to try and see these dynamics as well and to be able to help build strategies around the, 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 the grand scale dynamics. Uh, that are happening in the economy. Yeah. I mean, if I had to point to any dynamic that leads to the reemergence of the large classes, it would be kind of cracks in the foundations of society that can, you know, guarantee a certain level of consumption. And it's what, it's what like a body of sociological research calls post-material needs and the kind of psychological expressive needs that dominate politics once you know, the food supply stabilizes and, you know, the, the assassinations over whether workers or capitalists are going to control capitalism, you know, subside and, you know, labor unions get kind of corralled into their place. The whole kind of class compact stabilizing process and then the elimination of labor unions. Now it looks like the 
I don't want to say the falling apart of the logistics grid, but the the obvious decay of the logistics grid in in the face of like over the past five years, and the logistics way that the grid. shelves look in America, like and in the United States, you know, I'm talking, I am talking about you know, like the the tiger's mouth, the belly of the beast, but it's telling that you know you have empty shelves out here, like the, those. I think the that kind of material stability has a way of like taking the piss out of the big classes even though they are still big determinants and, you know, I wouldn't be a Marxist if I didn't think so, but yeah, once that stability goes away, that is really when you start to see, and, and yeah, I guess to point to what Bob is saying about the housing market and the, you know, extreme difference, if you can ima- see, you know, I have to adjust the American economy for never having 2007, like, right. And kind of imagining if that trend continued and, there's enormous resentment here between renters and homeowners. Yeah. 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 It's the same, same everywhere. Like in the West, that's, that is, that's, that is the tactic, the long-term end goal of the breakdown in the, you know, the compromise between labor and capital in the post-war mm-hmm. period is essentially the commodification of housing full scale and a, and a shift towards a rentier capital class and a, a, a whole swathe of people that cannot afford to buy a home. Like that I mean, is that's, that's yeah. so destabilizing here. That's yeah. that's the dynamic that Engels pointed to. That was like, ah, I don't know about this American workers' movement. They could probably just all be bought off with this cheap expropriated land, right? And, and they were, and they were. There wasn't a single thing that any of the big heads of Marxism that said about said about America that was as accurate as, as that. Yeah, like, right. The be- we, the beards were the most right about that one. I mean, well, Marx that, wasn't. That, Engels was right. And I think the other thing as well is that we have had, like, because of the collapse of that, like, the other dynamic that's incredibly important to me is because of that collapse of the compact, we have, as, as, uh, you know, this dynamic we see everywhere where all the social democratic parties had nowhere to go only to the right, and the right wing parties had only nowhere to go only to, to the right of that and to culture war. And so we have this whole scale shift of the political ground to the right. And like that systemically, that like that will see something grow. Like it just for me, like a system just like it, it's a system necessity, something will grow in response to that. And it's like, you know, that is a to me a large thing with I know it's it's the same process probably as well, but it, it's another aspect of that process that we're seeing with this rentier return to a rentier capitalist dynamic. Yeah, and I guess there's a sort of like part of the reason that I think it's a good reason to read this book right now is that when we started this book, there was a sort of wave of discussion around the quote PMC, the quote professional managerial class. And it came from a sort of uh, reactionary place, a sort of class analysis that's like, who are these leftists anyway? They're a bunch of sociology professors and English teachers, but you know, kind of like doing a professional sort of analysis of the coalition of the types of people who tend to be into this stuff. And it, you know, seems pretty obvious that the right has their own kind of coalition of grifters, Mm -hmm. right? Like they have their own PMC, really. They have their own quote PMC, but they're slightly like the professions are different. They are. They're different professions. It's a different coalition of professions. And that's, you know, it would be sort of helpful for us to think about that. Like in America, there are these like grifters and like real estate proprietarians and fucking, I don't know. Oil. What are they? What are their prote- what are the professions? Seriously, what are the professions of these right wing grifters? Do you reckon? Uh, for the right wing grifters, I would say, I mean, less like oil. Uh, thinking of like the middle, like the PMC kind of middle management type of people, the professional people who aren't like big bourgeois. What comes to mind first is obviously econ professors or economics people. Sure, yeah, right. And then the evolutionary uh, biologists. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah but a bunch I of think. them joined. A bunch of them joined, like, like the the right wing kind of whatever you want to call it, discourse coalition or or block or whatever, right? Like a lot of them are these people, like who have some kind of basis in psychology or evolutionary biology of some kind, right? Oh yeah, like a lot of the like a lot of the academics, they're like mirror images of the left. They're just you know yep. different a different part of the, the two academic cultures, let's say, the, yeah. the more positivist, you know, common, common sense. Uh, we just did all this math to prove something that Reagan wants. So 
Like, right. what, yeah, what would what would a uh, hunter gatherer from ten thousand years do for a Rolex watch? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the type of analysis they do. Yeah, like <laughs> what? Well, but beyond what that, what would beyond... you do for a Rolex watch? Beyond that, there are there are like I don't know. This is this is not maybe the biggest force in the right, but like alternative health hucksters. Yeah, like, that's a big like. That was a big thing in American society that kind of spun off even from the new left and new religious movements. But yeah. it's now like it's not a, it's not where a lot of leftists are coming from. No, that that's been that's been seated to the right fully, and you know, well, and COVID is COVID has pushed that too, right? Like yeah, very, this very, very hard. hard. That like, was present before it, COVID. But, but you're both, yeah, you're both. Totally oh, right. oh, oh, I just, I just mean it. it it's, I think it's intense. I think it's intensified the dynamic. You're completely Absolutely. right. Like, like, for, like, there was a lot of talk. For instance, like, in, uh, came, I just came from the west coast of Canada, and it's all like kind of granola shit, right? And like mm-hmm. tons, tons of yoga people went full Q and right. right, 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 right. Because yeah. their, their, like, their communications networks and kind of. You know, di- even their digital social networks and so on were so were so easily articulated with a kind of QAnon right leaning thing. So, so actually, when yeah. they found out in terms of who went the most for the most hardcore far right anti vax startup party in Canada, the People's Party of Canada, not an all an anonymous sounding name. It turns out that that the party, like the first party that they that uh, that lost the most votes to them. In which they gained a huge amount of votes in the last election were the conservatives, which made sense to me. But the second most, the party that lost the sec- second largest share of their voters was the Green Party. Let us great. Let, let us let us let us guess. Yeah. Did anybody hear what he said it was? I, I heard it, but I, I won't say. Oh, okay, okay, you guess. Say it again, there, Bob. I was going to say the Greens. I'm yes. The Greens. Yeah. All right. Ding 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 ding. Uh, Tom, you are the winner. You guess what you won. What did I win? You won a one-way ticket to hell. Luxury, seven-day stay in Quebec. Anyway, that's the same thing. <laughs> that's, that's but yeah, if you're if you're involved in that kind of new age health space, I mean, that might be a very good example of like kind of like a micro mm-hmm. class effect, you know, like yeah, and, um, and a differentiated appeal. The way yeah, Q went appeal. went after the crunchies is exemplary. Look, I don't love political manipulation, but I do. if there's a bunch of crumb, well, I don't. I I kind of hate it on an interpersonal level. I think it's usually fucked up. However, in aggregate, when you're dealing with the potential of a bunch of crunchies that might go fash because they're like, and look, I'm a little skeptical of this narrative, but I'm gonna just regurgitate it because they got you know uh, the algorithm is their sorting hat, and it just you know it just brought out some fascism that wasn't there before. Again. Right, I'm a little skeptical here, but if you if Avola, <laughs> right? But if Marxists can, I don't know if they could do something to intervene so that a bunch of people that just want peace, love, and understanding, you know, don't become Nazis or whatever, then like, sure, fine. Thinking about making our appeals a little more modular, you know, to the different types of people, you know, once we get our head out of German metaphysics, we realize that the proletariat isn't this abstract sphere of being that's undifferentiated you know it's like that this is another thing that i like about this kind of sociological analysis that right is pulling from and it's i don't know marxists hate it for good and bad reasons is that it concerns the thoughts of the people involved it shows a concern for their consciousness and where it comes from (laughs) really and not where oh not just oh well it should come from this because their life chances and the property relations say it should come from this okay and if we were all, if we all behaved like rational choice robots, sure, we would, we would do that. But, but, but you know, it's not the people I've known. That's no. not the life I've lived. But I've it's not been, even, I would even say like, if you're a rational choice person, like in your own small <laughs> rational choices that you have to make, you go on the micro oh. classes because there, there is no avenue for the major thing. You know, the, the uh, yeah. conditions aren't correct. <laughs> So it's like, I've, yeah, I guess I've, I guess I've always taken that rationality would mean long term thinking, which would mean, of yeah. course, communism. But, you know, that's nope. that's not how everybody thinks. Well, what, it, what this also reminds me of is that there's there's a uh, kind of interesting take on standpoint epistemology, but taking it not as epistemology, but rather methodology um, yeah. from uh, Marxist yeah. feminist Dorothy Smith about how our institutional 
the kind of institutional relations that we have with our colleagues, but also with the institutions themselves shape our thoughts and opinions and our, our standpoint, right? And the kind of microclass is the occupation as the institutional framework in which the game, in which the moves that we make are determined, right? Is and how that forms our kind of cultural and political viewpoints or cultural and political standpoints, if you will, is I think fascinating. I also want to say that I, I blame Oprah for the uh, right wing health grift. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's <laughs> fair. That's definitely fair. Yeah, you. Know, I, I'm not even being ironic. I, I do blame Oprah. Well, I, I'd say in even other place like where you can see the the political importance of that mi the micro classes is, is uh, like at least here as a from where I am uh, in in Canada, right? Where it's like oil and gas workers. Like the relationship of oil and gas workers to the like kind of what you might call like a kind of ex an extractivist regime of accumulation that structures like Canada's political economy and that is also entwined with finance and so on means like if you were just looking, it's like, okay, they don't they don't own the oil companies, they don't own the rigs, they are wage work or they're salary workers. Well, they should be somehow allied with you know other wage workers. What's really happened is that they've become much more politically enmeshed and supportive of their employers, right? Like they're very well paid though, aren't they, Bob? Yes, but that's but this is this is what I'm getting at where it's like the 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 structure of the oil and gas economy in Canada has allowed them to simultaneously be much better paid than the average waged or salary worker who does not like own the means of production in Canada, but also has allowed but is also there's like an ignorance of the the their, their own like the only economy they work in where it's like, oh no, fossil capital in Canada has like worked very hard to like undermine uh, structurally any kind of refining act activity, which would like maximize the amount of jobs per barrel of oil and gas that we produce, which would be good for them. It has worked really hard to like minimize royalty payments as per share of, of, of barrel produced. So that like when there's a decline in prices, like 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 all of their services are dried up, like there's no savings in their local communities and their local governments to pay for things like services mm -hmm. and so on. And so it's like they're actually getting they're simultaneously like getting screwed by their the, the faction of capital that employs them. But it, it's also given them very different life chances, worldviews. Many of them don't have university, need college or university educations, which means that there's like a, a whole area of like, like kind of a, a common cultural capital. And so like. If you weren't looking at the very specific aspects of the like micro class of oil and gas workers, which itself is actually uh, variated and segmented in, mm -hmm. a, segmented in a, whole, a whole bunch of ways, you would not be able to under, you'd be like, oh, well, like, I don't know, like the environmental movement's like promising them like a just transition or whatever. And it's like, none of them buy it, no, right? No. Uh, but all they see is somebody threatening their job and they have a good paying job. And that someone threatening their job who has a university education, who yeah, said, go, going back, unfortunately, to that like PMC argument, like there is a certain amount of truth to it. It's like the environmentalists mostly come from bourgeois okay. backgrounds, or increasingly some of the environmental justice movement is is indigenous. But like, but even many indigenous peoples are being like integrated into that industry, even even if that industry is like destroying like their territories in a whole variety of ways. But it's like, yeah, they're like they're they're being rapidly like they are like the the cutting edge of like the neo fascist movement in Canada. And I will say though, I do agree with the skepticism of like the liberal thing of like blaming everything on the algorithm, but certainly filter bubbles and echo chambers that are partially algorithmic and are also partially being constructed by right-wing grifters online, very consciously, that is playing a role. Like it is, it is helping get, it's helping connect people's experiences to, and, and life experiences and kind of micro class position to a particular political project and the interests of other classes and, and groups in a way that is that that is not just it's algorithmic but it's also very conscious like there's organic intellectuals that just spend yeah. all their time uh, working online to keep people within those spaces it's not like just well, the some, algorithm thing is isn't like completely yeah. bullshit it's bullshit in that like you know the example that Ezri was giving earlier with the crunchy people like there's always been an element of, of fascism yes. within hippie yes. crunchy culture that's not just brought out by facebook algorithms but facebook algorithms or, or social media algorithms in general are not fully responsible, with it, but they play a role. They just they do. do. They, 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 they are part of the overdetermination of right. Like they are a key if, aspect yeah. of, you, what, of what's happening. The, if you take the black pill on the Enlightenment and that it becomes its own reactionary myth making, you know, it's all over the place. And yeah, it's, it's just that like 
certain expressions can bring it out. Like I, you know, yeah. I was into alternative hip hop and there are a lot of crunchy people there and people that are very predisposed to being like racially integrated. So in some ways, like, you know, you would expect left wing biases, a lot of sympathies towards black nationalism, this sort of thing. This does not necessarily go in a left wing direction. Anyone that's mm-hmm. paid attention to the career of KRS one, for instance, will know that he became, oh, he's like, he became a Trumper, right? He became like a hard, a hard right guy. Yeah, he was in one of Alex Jones's documentaries. And, like, Same thing with yeah. Professor Griff from yeah. Public Enemy. Although Professor Griff, Griff was always anti-Semitic, right? Yeah, he was very anti-Semitic. No, no but he, he, that guy's honestly just holding the torch for an old reactionary form of black nationalism. He's sort of a he, sort well, of a different problem. But well, yeah. wasn't there also like a sort of, of like, like white, white intellectual naivety where like people mis- misunderstood the comp- the political complexity and contradictions within various forms of black nationalism? Yeah. yeah. Right. Like Corey Robin just wrote that whole book I wanted to read on like Clarence Thomas, where he's like, it's he's not just like a sellout. It's like there's a weird reactionary strain of black nationalism mm-hmm. he grew up with that just makes him hate the state, hate the idea of the welfare state and just really want like African Americans in in the United States to like to just be fighting a war of all against all, right? Like it's a weird Hobbesian shit show that Robin, at the very least, argues. I don't know how good the argument is, but argues that some of that it's it's not like he just turned his head. He just like he just turned away from his radical roots. It's that the radical roots were always kind of ambivalent in some ways, and they could go in different ways depending on the the situation. Okay, everybody, I have a question for you. This is this is, uh, this is like a quiz, okay? Guess who's back in the chat? <gasps> ah, good old Oswald. What? Spencer. But yes, we see Mr. Our, our, Decadence himself. Our friend Wait, who, Wayne what? Slutsky is in the chat. Yeah, Ray, Wayne Gretzky is here. Yeah. Who would yeah. have thought that Wayne Gretzky was such a fan of our show? I feel bad because I'm looking at Wayne Gretzky and I'm I'm realizing I think he is just kind of a bog standard Canadian conservative. I'm not sure he's a fascist, but. Did you say that you saw Wayne Gretzky doing a Hitler salute to a maple flag? Like that is that is what I say, and I stand by it in the public record. Wayne, Wayne, Wayne Gretzky ate my baby that I birthed out of my vagina. Yeah, that is. <laughs> I was a copy of Wayne Gretzky's 3D hockey. I fucking love Wayne Gretzky's 3D hockey. That game was revelatory. All right, game I'm rips. Sure it well. Yeah, you're not wrong. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, will, we, will we start the second slide? Yeah, let's yeah. Let's, yeah. Let's, let's read some slides. So I'll, I'll take the first one then. So basically, this work by Grisky and Wheaton started in the late '90s, and has basically came up with this whole new idea of micro class analysis. Their proposal is to, was to build class analysis on the basis of highly disaggregated occupational categories or micro classes. This is in contrast to the typical big classes of the Marxist Weberian traditions. Gruski considers this a neo-Durkheimian approach to class analysis in recognition of Durkheim's understanding of occupations as the fundamental unit of economic activity, solidarity and interest in the developed capitalist economies. Wright will go on to argue that these different approaches to class tap into different kinds of causal mechanisms that are appropriate for different kinds of analysis. Does anyone want to say anything about Durkheim? So I don't really know much sociology. So who was Durkheim and what's their buzz? Durkheim is kind of considered the foundational figure of sociology as a whole, but specifically of functionalism. So conflict theory, which is associated with with Marx and kind of views Marx as the founder, conflict theory looks at the kind looks at sociology through the framework of conflicting social interests, um, whereas functionalism looks at sociology as you know there's a purpose to different institutions and. If there is a conflict, then something has gone wrong. I mean, Durkheim himself is is like an earlier figure in sociology. He wrote the fact, like he pre... He's considered the founder of sociology, he's, yeah, basically. Yeah, the single, like if there's one, one guy, guy. Yeah. it's Durkheim. Does he, pre- he, wrote does he found- predate Weber? Uh, yeah. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he predates okay. Weber, he, yeah. His, the first kind of sociological text is his book on su- suicide. Yes, yeah, yeah. It's a study of suicide rates in Catholic and Protestant populations, where he, he more or less argues that, you know... You, you Rosy know, stuff. Well, you know, that, yeah, so-called civilized uh, people tend to commit suicide more. Uh, richer people tend to commit suicide more. People that don't struggle with the conditions of existence tend to commit suicide more. It's a found, foundational, like, study in sociology. Extraordinarily positivist, Durkheim, you know, really wants to make it a science-ass science. So... 
maybe part of the spirit that a lot of Marxists object to in sociology that I don't necessarily, but you know, what makes it neo Durkheimian probably best for you know, other people to get into, I suppose, because of this emphasis on a prediction and, you know, classical sort of positivist hopes for sociology, perhaps. And There's a footnote where Wright explains why this is very, they consider themselves neo Durkheimian versus just Durkheimian, but it's kind of uh, beside the point. So, like, it, would it be a fair thing to say about, like, what you're talking about, how it's, like, a positivist, is that, you know, if you were to de- look at physics or something, you would say, like, if something was positivist, that it, it's not looking at the kind of, you know, the core essence, but looking at the, uh, you know, the epiphenomena and using, you know, predicting using epiphenomena instead of phenomena. I mean, I, I certainly don't think that they would consider themselves as using epiphenomena. They think by identity, you know, a positive positivist approach to social science imagines that if you can capture the predictive sort of like function, then you've identified the essence of some sort. Yeah. Like whatever you're not, whatever you can't, you're not able to measure is not a thing that really exists, right? Like it's not like there's some kind of core, like some, some, some kind of hidden core to the world that the phenomena is expressing in like a mystified or misleading manner. Right. It's like, yeah, you just you, you, you look at what's happening and then that's that's the essence. Right. To, to put it in a way that you might be more familiar with, Tom, is, is that like a positivist would would just dismiss a positivist in the social sciences would dismiss labor theory of value outright because the kind of core essence of, of labor is not something that's necessarily measurable or maybe not labor, but like um, value rather. Yeah. Yeah, yeah like, I, I, like marginalist I, theories of value are like much more attractive to a positivist viewpoint, like in, you know, like in kind of classical economics, depending on how you, you know, your, your opinion of neoclassical economics, I guess, but precisely because it's like what the difference between what someone is willing to pay and what someone's willing to sell it for is like easily measurable, right? Like, yeah. it's, it's like, it's, it's the price, it's the price, like they don't, like, like, like neoclassical economics doesn't care about like the idea that there's some like hidden foundation for how economic value is produced that may not be measured in uh, the price signal that simply emerges between the sellers and buyers, the interaction of sellers and buyers on the market. The only thing they really care about, like, because like, that's just like metaphysics, right? Yeah. However, there are more rationalistic forms of positivistic analysis, Mm -hmm. because that's where the whole concept of value in political economy comes from. Mm -hmm. They're trying to make a science out of economics and they posit value as this rationalistic term and if they can justify it within the realm of you know scientific hypothesis and and deduction or whatever then it's okay but i I think what you said you know since like the 1970s basically where people more or less fall on the side of oh this marx is actually just sort of doing critical theory and the numbers aren't important versus well, we have this really nice neo-Ricardian reconstruction. Yeah, that's definitely where value theory and uh, positivism sort of part ways. I guess the other thing I'd say about Durkheim is that he's an extreme holist uh, when it comes to analysis. He's not extraordinarily concerned with the actions of individuals. He is concerned with big groups, social facts. And, you know, Wright is more individualist than Durkheim. Like Wright prefers to break things down, even though he doesn't think it should be required. He shares some of the sort of methodological holism of Durkheim, I guess. But you know, Wright is interested. Wright is interesting because it, it, even in, within sociology, he's a, a bit of a rare beast in which he wants to look at both micro and macro scale phenomena. Usually in sociology. At least from what I recall from my one-on-one class. Heck one. <laughs> yeah, you, you're either doing yeah. micro or macro. And if you're doing micro, it's symbolic interactions, interactionism. Good job, kiddo. Footnote two on page 113. Uh, Grotsky's characterization of his approach as neo-Durkheimian is most clearly developed in the foundations of neo-Durkheimian class analysis. His treatment of occupations as the core basis for solidarities in the division of Labor differs from Durkheim's analysis by dropping the idea of the functional interdependence among occupations, collective consciousness, and other elements of Durkheim's theory of organic solidarity. It retains an affiliation with Durkheim in its focus on occupations within the divisions of labor 
as the central units of coherent social organization in modern society, but largely disengages from Durkheim's broader agenda of social theory. So basically, what makes them neo-Durkheimian is that they, they're driving the idea of functional independence among occupations, collective consciousness, and other elements of Durkheim's so basically, they call, they drop the interdependent stuff and the collective consciousness stuff. Yeah, there's no, there's they're a little bit less holistic. Yeah, actually. yeah, yeah. So they're even less systemic. To take out any these kind of, you know, uh, relational stuff between the occupations. It so seems like it, yeah. Because well, like fu- functional, Durkheim is functional is, interdependence. It, right. It could be conflict. It could be something else. Right. Yeah. But the, having a, a holistic model of how the two things work in a system. Like how, you know, th- this, for instance, Marxism tends to synthesize conflict theory and, and function, you know, like we think about what class struggle has this ultimate goal, this telos inside of it. You know, that's unusual for conflict theory in a sense, at least as understood by, you know, bare sociology where, you know, what's the purpose of a conflict? I don't know. Could just be to fight. Like Marxists are like, no, 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 no. You don't understand. This is history unfolding. Right. Like. And this is this drops that kind of sense of greater social telos. It's interesting to note two things about Durkheim that's different here. Think something that's similar and something that's different. Durkheim is known as like a macro sociologist. And this is very much, as the name implies, not. It's micro. But what's similar about both of them is that Durkheim and structural functionalism has a reputation for being a bit conservative. And this comes from like a neoliberal kind of end of history view of like, well, they're, we, the game that we're playing is settled. We're, it's capitalism. The rules of the game are basically settled. There's a tendency to, in the Western developed capitalist countries towards just accepting neoliberalism as the standard. So now we're just going to focus on what moves you can make within the game in this microclass analysis. 